everyone. Welcome back to your online lab activity. This week, we are going to be looking at photosynthesis. But before we get into that, I just wanted to, what I called a note on mental health from your friendly TA. And I just wanted to reach out and talk about something that's not frequently talked about in biology classes as much as I think that it should be. So this part of the semester is rough. I'm sure you're feeling it. I'm feeling it. Assignments are starting to pile up. People we know are getting sick. And things are just stressful. And so don't feel guilty prioritizing taking care of yourself. I know that this is something I really struggle with and even continue to struggle with, where I feel the need to just perform at a high level and I'm afraid of falling behind or showing any kinds of weakness because I feel like as a STEM major, I should have everything together. But you are a person and you are important. So make sure that you are taking time to take care of yourself. There is a fantastic book. Um, you don't have to read this by any means, but this helped me personally. It's called The Imposter's Cure. And a quote I like from it is, you're intelligent, you have already achieved great things. Otherwise, what would you have to doubt? And I'm guessing you have a proven track record of success. And that is each and every one of you guys. You are in college. Out of all of the students that OU could have taken, they chose to admit you to their program. So this is already testament to your ability to do this. And you're stronger and capable and smarter than you might feel right now. Another sentiment that really helps me is to remember that just because something is hard doesn't mean that I'm stupid, and it doesn't mean that you're stupid. Um, I took this sentiment from somewhere else, I saw it in a meme, but I couldn't find that original meme, so I just made this graphic. But we're all science majors here. What we study is hard, it's complicated, it's fun, and we're really privileged to get the chance to study all of this. But it's not something that comes easy. So just because a concept is difficult doesn't mean that you're stupid. And just because somebody else gets it faster than you doesn't mean anything at all. We're all on our own journey. And it's important to remember not to be too awfully hard on yourself. And finally, do you remember that OU has a really great counseling center? They are doing Zoom counseling now. So you can have individual, group, or couples therapy. Um, and this is totally covered if you have the OU student health plan and is pretty affordable if you don't. So here's the website. It's just ou.edu slash UCC, or you can Google it and it'll come up. And here's the phone number where you can call and make your initial appointment. Basically during that, they'll do a little intake with you and then you can get matched with the counselor or you can join one of these groups. Um, they have them about... Feel Better Fast, which just gives you some coping skills for college. They have some international student support groups and anxiety support group. Those for LGBTQ people, trauma. There's a bunch of resources here. So I know there's a bunch of stigma surrounding mental health and counseling and all of that. But I do encourage you that you can reach out to see what it's all about. There is no shame whatsoever in going to therapy or getting help. So no one even needs to know that can stay totally confidential between you and your therapist. So if you're feeling the stress, I would recommend to go ahead and reach out to all these resources that we have here at OU. Okay, so box over. So now let's get into the science. So for this investigation, this should be pretty old news to you guys at this point. But before you read um, all of this and watching this video, you should have read and completed the laboratory background with all those pre-lab questions. And now um, go ahead and watch this lecture, then watch the lab simulation video that Dr. Shaw uploaded, and then use the provided data to make your graphs. You will then complete your lab summary and upload it to Canvas along with a Flipgrid video. So today's investigation is why do some plants grow better under certain lining conditions than others? So 
if you're in person for this lab, this is the sort of setup that you would have going on. And there are two parts of the experiment that we are testing today. One of them is measuring the carbon dioxide production. That's here, the CO2 is the way we abbreviate that. And the other is leaf pigments. Your goal is to describe how they're linked. And we'll talk about that a bit more when I walk you through forming your hypotheses. You start by cutting off a leaf from the Scleferia plant, which um, you need a leaf that's about five inches across. You can see here, this entire thing is one leaf, even though it has several different petals. And then you need to trim off the petiole, which is the stem, so that the leaf can lay flat in the respiration chamber, like this one is shown here in the picture. And the leaves need to be facing up for this experiment to work right. After that, you would go over to the light chamber, which is designed with 16 feet of LED lights. They are pretty fragile, so you have to be super careful when you're actually doing this experiment, but you don't have to worry about that too awfully much since we are doing this experiment online this year. These lights have a remote control, which is attached to a power supply and lets you adjust the different kinds of lights that are produced by this light box. So here's what it looks like when these lights are all lit up. You could have green light, blue light, or red light. This can manipulate the color as well as the wavelength of light that you're using to test your hypothesis. And again, the colors we're using are red, green, and blue for this experiment. Then we also have one that's just our uh, control group where we put a brown paper sack over it so it's total darkness and there should be no photosynthesis occurring whatsoever. That way we can compare a baseline to our different experimental groups. For this, we set up Logger Pro to collect 10 samples every minute for 15 minutes. So in the enzyme investigation we did, I just had you look at the screen and get the readings from there. For this, we want to actually watch the trend line grow up and also have these individual readings, um, 10 per minute for 15 minutes. The carbon dioxide sensors worked better for this experiment when Dr. Shaw was working on making the video. So ordinarily, we would also have the oxygen level, but that didn't work so well for the data and was a little harder to interpret. So we just have the carbon dioxide uh, data for you to interpret. So can this procedure that we're using actually measure the plant growth? Not really, but there are a couple relevant things to keep in mind when we're talking about this. So photosynthesis using, uses carbon dioxide to make food for the plant. So it follows that more food equals more growth, right? So if photosynthesis is not happening, then we should have a buildup in CO, build up of CO2 in the chamber at a positive rate rate because remember the plants have mitochondria. This is something that students often forget because you don't really think about plants needing energy or uh, using respiration, but they do. So these mitochondria are constantly doing cellular respiration, which produces carbon dioxide. So if they're respiring, making carbon dioxide, but they're not using that carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, it's going to build up in the chamber. However, if photosynthesis is happening, then that should be using the CO2 faster than it's made, and the chamber should be close to zero or decreasing below a zero rate for carbon dioxide. And the faster that decreases, the faster the rate of photosynthesis is happening because it's using up that excess carbon dioxide. So just think of it this way. An increased rate of photosynthesis would lead to increased food production, which would lead to increased plant growth. So we can sort of view this simulation as measuring the rate of photosynthesis, which 
would be a proxy for the uh, plant growth. So why does the color of light matter? Think about for a second what's happening here in this picture. Some of the wavelengths of light get absorbed by the plant and some of them get reflected. So again, think about this picture for a second. What color do you think is getting reflected? The answer is that plants actually reflect green light, which is kind of opposite of what you might think because they're green. But what's happening is it's absorbing all of these other colors and instead the green light kind of bounces off. And so that's why we see the green because it's not being absorbed, it's getting reflected. So the more wavelengths that get absorbed by the leaf, the more photosynthesis should be happening since that sunlight is what's powering and giving energy for photosynthesis to occur. So there are a couple different pigment molecules that actually absorb all of that energy from light. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is called carotenoids, which is simulated here by this yellow line. And you can see here that it primarily absorbs purple and blue lights. So if you look at our y-axis, we've got the relative absorbance in percentage here. So the higher these peaks, the more absorption is happening. And then on the x-axis, we've got the color and wavelength of the light. So it goes all the way from purple to red over here. This dark green line is representing chlorophyll A. So you can see here, there's a peak right above this purple color. And then there's another peak over here at this red, which means that it's absorbing these purple and red colors. And then chlorophyll B is another pigment that has two peaks as well, one here that's very high at the purple and blue, and one here at the orange color. So we can see from this graph how the highest peaks here are around the purple to blue range, and then there's another fewer little peaks over here in the orange and red range, but almost no, uh, none of the pigments absorb any of the green light here. So the plant that we're testing has a combination of all three of these pigments. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your hypothesis of what you think is going on. What wavelengths are actually providing the energy for photosynthesis to occur? So your hypothesis should link the light color, the plant pigment, and the photosynthetic rate. So an example template for this could be plants, sorry, plants photosynthesize faster or slower under a certain light condition because something about their pigments here. So you can actually use these, this wording except for obviously the places you need to fill in. But let's say plants photosynthesize, photosynthesize faster under let's say this blue light condition because the chlorophyll B is so high of a peak. So we can say that plants photosynthesize faster under the blue light conditions because chlorophyll B will be absorbing more wavelengths and providing more energy. That could be a hypothesis. You could make up another hypothesis as well. As I have reminded you all before in lab that I care more about your hypothesis being testable then I care about it being correct. So it's something you need to have specific that you can test that makes sense, but it could be wrong and that's fine. Then based on your data, whether you can see which one photosynthesizes faster and which one is ideal for plant growth, recommend which color of light you think is best for the plant growth. We're adding something to lab summaries this week that we want you to include, and that is at the very top, I want you to include your hypothesis clearly stated, your independent and dependent variables, your control group, and your experimental group. So these don't count for your word limit, but I do want them clearly and explicitly stated, and I'll show you an example here in just a second. 
But one final thing is just feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. I am here to help. I'm happy to answer anything that I can, can to help this make sense to you. Um, again, don't wait till the very last minute or else I might not be able to help. But if you do this earlier on in the week, then I should be able to help you. So here's a document that kind of just shows you what I was talking about. Obviously, you want to have your name on your summary. But I want you to have your hypothesis. Pants go to set aside faster under blue light conditions because of the, the of the toric LV or whatever your hypothesis is. I want you to say what the independent variable is here. Remember the independent variable is what we change. So think about what we are changing in these different trials. The dependent variable is what we're measuring. So think about what data we're collecting and what you're getting from that. What the control group is, from whether there's one that's not getting any light, then there's one that's getting red light, one that's getting blue light, and one that's getting green light. What your experimental groups are, so that should be the other three that I mentioned except for the control. And then go on with the rest of your summary like normal. This part isn't on the rubric this week, but it is something you're gonna be graded on. So make sure that you pay attention and have these. And again, this does not count towards your 300 word limit, but everything below it does. So as always, remember to check the rubric and follow that as closely as possible. And let me know if you need any help or have any questions.